So this is the first video in a series of four where um, we're just beginning Pilates. So this is your first ever Pilates class. For those of you that are new to this video channel, um, where do you start? This session is purely about connecting the brain to parts of the body, to ranges of movement that your brain has put on the back burner, um, has put onto low priority because we're not doing it very regularly. Um, and so there'll be certain movements that you would have lost. Also, it's about proprioception, your brain's ability to find your body in space, and interoception, your brain's ability to go inside the body and to start to look at things and connect with them. Um, these are very important things um, that we have lost because of modern day living, um, sitting at computers, sitting at desks, sitting in cars for too long, a whole range of things that we're doing that is disconnecting us from our, our healthy, balanced body and taking us into unusual postures and um, the brain not really talking to muscles in the way that it should do because we're sedentary and we're living um, habitually unhealthy patterns. So um, you come to the studio for the first time, you've never done Pilates before, where do we start? Well, first of all, I think I'm gonna start with you with your vagus nerve, because for all of us now, for the last two years, we've been living in a very unhealthy, unnatural world where we have been bombarded with information, with fear, um, disconnected from the tribe and from the village and from the people that we're con usually connected with. Um, just so many things that have damaged us on so many levels, but, but what it has done is it's put us into a perpetual state of fight or flight over and over again, listening to the radio, listening to the television, listening to people's conversations. All these things have taken us out of that lovely balanced state that we should be in most of the time and put us into a position of anxiety, unease, disease, disease, um, and just taken us out of the place that we should be. So when we do exercise, if we approach it from the very beginning by looking at our vagal nerve, we bring ourselves into a state where our body is in agreement and is receptive to improving and to moving forward. So if you're, the, the vagal nerve has got three branches, so this is called the polyvagal theory. We used to think the vagal nerve was one nerve and it was one of the 12 cranial nerves that comes down through the brain stem, into the face, ears, mouth, into the heart, lungs, into digestion, reproduction. So everything from here to here has influence through the vagal nerve. So they're finding now that the vagal nerve has three branches. So the ventral vagal nerve is the one at the front of the body, and that is the one that is socially engaged, it's happy, it's balanced, it's seeing, it's hearing, it's digesting, the heart rate's normal, the breathing's normal, reproduction, all working normal, hormones working normally. Then we've got our fight and flight, which is our central vagus nerve, which goes down through the spine, which is either going to draw us into defense or into attack. It's going to draw us to run away or it's going to draw us to go forward. And then we've got the, um, the dorsal vagal nerve, which is the one that is at the back of the body and it's much more primal. And the dorsal vagal nerve is where if we are in a perpetual state of fight, flight, fight, flight, fight, flight, there comes a time, you know, if we're shocked and upset enough that we'll regress into a very primal state, which is a state of paralysis, of shutdown. And I think, you know, after two years of what we've been through, um, a lot of us are in this state where we are feeling low, we're feeling depressed, low energy, um, low motivation, actual depression, um, aches and pains in the body, aches and pains in the joints, not sleeping well, not really digesting our food properly, hormonal, hormonal imbalances, 
a whole array of things that are happening in our body because we've gone into this very deep defensive state which is almost a paralyzing state so how do we address this well it's very simple and it's very easy we just bring the um, the ventral vagal nerve the one at the front the one that's socially engaging and happy back into dominance and as that rises into dominance the other two get gently pushed back down into their correct place which is just to be there in reserve for when we really are in danger and when we really are threatened and we need to do something. So a very simple way to reset, there's a few ways, but there's a very simple way to reset your dorsal vagal nerve, the one at the front. And if you do this at the very beginning of any exercise session, you're bringing your body into a state of calm and safety. And in that state, the nervous system is receptive to everything that you do and you're going to be much more productive and you're going to have much more results. If you try and train your body when it's in fight and flight, you're not going to get such good results. If you're in that depressed dorsal um, vagal condition, then you're not going to get anywhere at all. You're not even going to want to train basically. So we're going to just do this very simple exercise. It only takes about a minute, a minute and a half. And you're going to just hold your chin. There's different ways of doing this, but this is my favorite way. Right hand holding your chin. You're taking two fingers out to the left, just to where you can see with your vision. And with both eyes, you're looking at that left hand. And keep your, hand, your eyes fixed on the fingers and just stay there 30 seconds. And what you're looking for, you're not going to make it happen. You're just going to wait for it to happen. Normal breathing, but you're just waiting for a sigh or a deeper breath, or maybe you swallow, or maybe you get a sensation of wanting to yawn. Don't let the skull turn towards the hand. Keep the skull very centered so that you feel the myofascial stretch through the eyes into the brain stem. So if you were to point your finger at the back of your throat, that's where your brain stem is. And you just keep looking at those fingers. And there comes a time when you take almost like a double breath, you breathe in, and then you breathe in again. There's a bit of a sigh. You might swallow, you might yawn. All of these things are evidence that you've just had this neurological reset and your vagal nerve has just balanced. Okay, so if it gets to 30 seconds and you still haven't had it, carry on for a full minute. So we just relax. So once you've done that, just give yourself, cover your eyes, just give yourself a moment, just let your brain assimilate that. If there's any feelings of disorientation, you can do this lying down on the floor. And they do suggest that the first few times you do this, you do it lying down because some people get quite a strong reaction the first time they've ever done this. So just holding the chin, left hand, two fingers of your right hand just into your peripheral vision. And without moving your skull, you're looking over to the fingers. You keep your eyes fixed on those fingers. If you find it hard to focus, just wiggle the fingers. So that gives your brain something really to look at. So sometimes you start to daydream and before you know it, your eyes have drifted. So just do what you need to, wiggle the fingers if you need to. How often do you do this? Maybe you do this once a day. And then gradually, you know, as you feel more and more balanced, you can do it once a week. And then just as you need to, when you feel a bit stressed, when you feel a bit out of balance. I like to do it whenever I remember because um, we're getting stressed and challenged every day. So it's just nice to bring yourself back into this optimal calm safe state so that's about 30 seconds i was talking so i missed my yawn but it was in there and then just gently relax come back into center roll the shoulders and then just close the eyes give yourself a moment so when you do this you'll you'll notice when you've done it your neck feels more relaxed your shoulders more relaxed your breathing is more regulated, your heart rate is steadier, you feel calmer, you feel peaceful, um, and you're just in that perfect state of mind now to do something new. So we'll go back to what is the beginning of your very first Pilates class. Just stand with your feet at hip space. Joseph Pilates called the torso 
the box, the long box. So your feet want to be lining up with the box. So you want to be lining up through the shoulders, through the hips and knees and the ankles. That's a nice stance. And then just soft in the, in the knees. So you're not pushing into the back of the knees. The knees are soft and relaxed. And to begin with, we're just going to focus on the shoulder girdle. So basically our body's got two groups of muscles, the shoulder girdle, the pelvic girdle. And we're going to strengthen and balance both of them and then bring ourselves into a more unified, strong core, um, moving from a strong center. So we're going to take the hands to the front of the body and we're just going to float the arms out to the side, turn the palms up level with the top of the shoulders. In this exercise, you don't want to be up here. You want your thumbs sort of just below the level of your shoulders so that these muscles coming from the shoulders into the neck, trapezius, are not overworking over time. So now you have to um, use what's called interoception. You're going inside your body with your brain and you're looking at your shoulder blades from the inside. And I want you to see if you could keep your hands in this position and just draw your shoulder blades down towards your heels. And just notice that movement. How does it feel in the neck, in the shoulders, biceps, triceps? upper back muscles, shoulder blade muscles. So there's your shoulder girdle working, chest muscles all working together. And then just release. So this shoulder girdle is a corporation of lots of different muscles, all with their job to do, all working to stabilize your upper spine, your neck, your shoulders, your arm movements, breathing, thoracic extension and flexion. So float the arms again. Have the thumbs just a little bit lower than the shoulders, not too bent in the elbows. Think of your arms as long wings, and you're going to slide your shoulder blades down towards your heels. And just take stock of how that feels in the brain. And then breathe. And relax. When I do this in the studio with clients, it's the most common movement for people to forget how to do it. They don't do this movement often, and so the brain puts it on low priority. So a good thing to do would be to get somebody to stand behind you and put their hands on your shoulder blades so that you become much more aware of your shoulder blades. So you're using proprioception, where you can feel the touch of the hand, and interoception, where you go inside your body with your brain so that you can connect with the shoulder blade to pull it down. And actually having someone physically touch you is going to give you lots more biofeedback to the brain because your brain has probably forgotten how to talk to your shoulder blades in this range of motion. So you're sliding the shoulder blades down. As you do that, your arms are not pulling in. So what people commonly do is they go like this and they think they did the movement, but they just move their arms. So keep the wings where they are glide the shoulder blades down the rib cage and there should be quite a you know noticeable movement gliding down you can feel the connection into your neck into your shoulders you can feel your lats your large upper back muscles you can feel your chest muscles all becoming very active biceps triceps deltoids all working together to depress your shoulder blades and then come back down so you're going to do this just four times but I want you to practice this every day for a week, four times. Slide the shoulder blades down. Breathe in, you're never holding your breath, and you come back down. Roll the shoulders. So even though you might have thought, oh, I can't feel anything moving, and I'm not sure if I did it right, your brain is connecting to those muscles. There's a, com a, a communication a conversation going on and what the brain is waiting for is for those muscles to respond and then answer the brain and then once you get that you reconnect that circuit in the brain and it suddenly gets taken from low priority and brought back into high, high priority again and then it becomes part of your new normal your new um, everyday movements that you use so um, and this one is the one that most often people tend to lose so the next one, you're going to come into a circle with your arms. You're going to keep the spine very still, very centered. And I want you to draw, visualize your two shoulder blades. You've got two vertical inner edges of your shoulder blades. I want your shoulder blades to gently be drawn in towards your spine. So what that looks like is 
The shoulder blades gently squeeze together, which pulls the arms open. You feel a lovely stretch across your chest. And then you close the movement with your arms. So what you've got to be careful in this one is that you don't start the movement with your arms. The shoulder blades are just drawing in towards your spine. You get that lovely chest stretch. So really the arms have not moved at all. They're hinging at the shoulder blade and they're just staying in that nice, long, gentle curve. And then you close the, close the fingers to finish the movement. So... As you do this, you're contracting your upper back muscles, your rhomboids, your trapezius, and you're stretching your chest muscles. So this movement's called retraction. You're retracting your shoulder blades. Make sure your neck doesn't crane forward. These are things that you might do wrong. You're only going to do it four times. And the other thing people do wrong is they pull, they go from that long curved arm to a bent elbow and, and, and draw back. So the arm should be just staying exactly as it is and just moving through that, that line. And the movement's in the shoulder blade, not in the arm muscles. So just do a few shoulder rolls and then turn your head. You'll notice that you're becoming quite aware of your neck muscles. So the neck muscles are probably the weak, the weak link in the shoulder girdle group. That's where all your tension is and that's where your stress is building up. So by doing these muscles and working on the deep stabilizers of your neck, you're going to bring your neck into a lovely balanced state. So the next one is called protraction. You're going to make the circle again with your arms. But this time, I'll stand sideways. You're going to keep your spine nice and still and you're going to glide the circle forward without changing the shape of the arm. So if your arms go into a long sort of oblong, you did it with your arms, not with the right muscles. So look at the circle of the arms. The circle, the whole circle moves forward. And now you're feeling a stretch between the shoulder blades and you're contracting your chest muscles. So you're doing the opposite to you did what you did with the retraction. So as you protract the shoulder blades, contracting your chest, stretching your rhomboids, your trapezius. Gently come back. So you're only going to do all of these exercises four times, but you want to do them perfectly. So make sure you're not overreaching because you can strain between the shoulder blades if you do that. Make sure your neck is not reacting to this. I'm doing this badly by craning my head forward. Neck dominant people are going to try to use their neck to do virtually any movement. So you've got to try and Use the right muscles and not allow the neck to jump in. So the final range is elevation. So we've had depression where the shoulder blades slide down. Now we're going to get um, elevation and the shoulder blades are going to slide up the rib cage. So you're going to make a circle again. Keep your middle fingers together. So that's called a closed chain rather than an open chain. So you could float the arms like this. That's an open chain movement. But we want to do it with the middle fingers together close chain and you're going to just take a nice big deep breath in and you're going to float the arms above the head and then you're going to see if you could stretch the circle upwards the circle might slightly change its shape but keep those middle fingers together feel the stretch on the underside of your shoulder blades those deep muscles under the shoulder blades and then come back into your middle position neutral and come back down so we do that again. We float the arms at an in-breath. So you've got lots of oxygen as you float the arms. And then the shoulder blades are gliding up the ribs. Come back down into the neutral position, the middle position, and come back down. So make sure you take that deep breath before you begin the movement. So you're not working with oxygen deficit. Normal breathing in the circle glides upwards and you feel the stretch under the shoulder blades you come back into your middle position you come back down so one more time nice big deep breath in as you float the circle you glide up 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 and you come back down into neutral and you come back into the body and again just move your neck so those four ranges depression retraction, protraction, elevation are the four ranges that your shoulder girdle can go through. And if you practice that four times on each movement every day for a week, you'll start to notice 
that the whole of the shoulder girdle is becoming more balanced. Your neck is feeling freer. Your shoulder range is improving. Your thoracic extension and flexion is improving. Your breath is improving. Your posture is improving. So that is where you start with your first session. So we're just going to add in a little bit more, which would be just start to address some of the lines of connectivity through the body. Have the feet quite close together. Just rock forward and feel the weight in the balls of the feet, the front of the feet, and then gently sway back and feel the weight into the heels of the feet. And just go from forward to back, to forward, to back. It's having to go to extremes because then I want you to come into the middle position. Just take a note of whether you could roll the feet outwards or you could roll the feet inwards outwards and inwards, outwards and inwards, and then come into the middle. So you're neither forward or back, you're neither turned out or turned in, you're just in that nice, perfect stance. A little bit of softness in the knees, and we're going to just get a sense of pulling up through our pelvic floor. So we think of that pelvic floor as like an elevator, with one, two, three floors. And so whether, regardless of whether you're male or female, we've all got pelvic floors and we can all create a sensation of pulling up from underneath between the front passage and the back passage. So you're pulling up gently, you're not clenching your bottom, but all the muscles that are on the underside of your pelvis between your pubic bone, your tailbone and your two sit bones, those bones at the bottom of your bottom, you just get a sense of pulling up. And it's just a very slight sensation. And as you, as the muscles pull up, we call that floor one. So floor one is a nice start to just getting engaged in the powerhouse in the low part and transversus and your low back muscles. You could also take your belly button and you could pull your belly button sort of halfway upwards, halfway back up the back of the rib cage. So if you think of a diagonal line through your belly button to sort of the middle of the rib cage, you're pulling your belly button gently upwards and backwards towards the back of the ribs. So if you combine that with the lift of the pelvic floor and the belly button pulling towards the back of the ribs, you'll notice as you pull your belly button towards the back of the ribs that your lift lifts up a bit higher as well. So your diaphragm and your pelvic floor, they work together, they're reciprocal with each other. The diaphragm is like a big trampoline and the pelvic floor is like a small trampoline and the pressure within the body and with the breath is causing them to pull up together and push down gently together. And in doing that, both of them stay nice and healthy and nice and toned. So pull up through the, the pelvic floor, through that pelvic lift to floor one, pull your belly button to the back of the ribs and feel that extra lift in your pelvic floor. Now your powerhouse is nicely active. Drop your chin with your knees a little bit soft. You're just rolling down to wherever you feel comfortable. So maybe that you need to support yourself and put your hands on your thighs. I'll do this sideways so you can see. So maybe your back's really tight and you need a little bit of support. Maybe you can put your hands on your shins. Maybe you can let your hands hang. That's up to you how it feels in the back of the body. Maybe you can touch the floor. Touching the floor is not a good indication of flexibility. So don't feel you have to touch the floor. Listen to how it feels in the back of the legs, in the bottom, calves, hamstrings, bottom muscles, low back. Take a breath into 360 degrees, expand your ribs. So just doing that is a lovely stretch for your body. And then as you breathe out, draw your sit bones, the bones at the bottom of your bottom, draw your sit bones together to contract your pelvic floor, tuck your tailbone under, Come up through the spine, one vertebra at a time, and then you're going to arch gently backwards. And so it sort of looks like a capital Y. So you don't want to be out here. The Y is up here. You're pulling your belly button to the back of the ribs. Keep your chin slightly tucked and just gently arch backwards. And then lift your heart and take another breath in. And as you breathe out, bring your chin down, bring your arms down. Roll the shoulders, move your neck. So we'll do that again, I'll stand sideways. So your knees are soft. You're pulling up to that first floor in the lift. You're pulling your belly button to the back of the ribs. You're dropping your chin. You're gently rolling forward and maybe 
it looks like hands on thighs, maybe it's hands on shins, maybe the hands are hanging, maybe you reach the floor, but only reach the floor naturally, not by straining. Take a breath into 360 degrees. So that lovely stretch with the breath, and as you breathe out, draw your sit bones together, tuck your tailbone under, restack your spine, pull your belly up into the back of the ribs, lift the head, lift the heart, keep the chin slightly pulled in, and inhale and lift the heart. Exhale. We do that one more time. Soften the knees, pull up through the pelvic floor, pelvic lift. Pull the belly button to the back of the ribs, drop your chin, rounding forward through the shoulders, through the rib cage. Come to wherever you feel comfortable. Take a 360 degree breath. As you breathe out, draw the sit bones together, tuck your tailbone under. So that's a pelvic tilt, engaging your powerhouse, engaging your pelvic floor, transversus coming up through the spine. Keep your chin slightly retracted, slightly pulled in as you breathe in. Lift your heart. Breathing out. Come back down. So that lovely stretch is stretching all the muscles of connection and myofascial connection in the front of the body, all the myofascial connections in the back of the body. So the next line of connection is your spiral line. So the spiral line starts in the neck, it comes down the back, it goes under the shoulder blades and it wraps around the rib cage, crosses over, wraps around the hips, goes down the legs, under the feet, up the inside of the legs, into the pelvic floor, through the spine, right the way back up the spine and back into the neck again. So a nice one for this one is to have your feet at hip space, lining up with the box of the body. So these are all terms that we're using and um, that you'll hear over and over again. These classes are your introduction to Pilates. They're not what we do in the classes. This is just all about reconnecting the brain to the muscles, strengthening the two girdles in the, in the body and preparing the body to then start to do the exercises. So this is your groundwork, your foundational work. And even at an advanced level, I like to come back to these um, fairly frequently just to make sure we're still coming back to the basics and saying very true to form. So the spiral line, we're going to cross our hands over on our shoulders. We're going to slightly retract our chin. We're going to keep our knees bent because that helps to keep your pelvis in a fixed position. And we're going to imagine our spine is like a coiled metal spring um, and as you rotate, the spring is stretching longer and you're becoming taller. So the way I describe that is an upward spiraling energy in the spine. So you're going to spiral up and around. You're going to feel like you're growing a little bit taller. The pelvis is not moving. You come back down into center. Do this one in front of a mirror if you're not sure. So your knees are soft. You're gently pulling up through the pelvic floor to that first floor in the lift. You're gently pulling your belly button to the back of the ribs. You're spiraling up and around to the left side. That gives you a beautiful stretch to your spine as well as the spiral line and you're coming back into center. If you find it hard not to move your pelvis, then you, you do this sitting on a chair. So try changing the breath pattern. We're going to breathe in, spiral up and around. And you'll notice on the in-breath, you go further and you feel a very deep connection breathing out with your diaphragm, which is the big muscle that's on the underside of your rib cage, um, like a dome of muscles that is underneath the lungs. So as you breathe in, you're really connecting with that lower half of your rib cage. So we're doing it to the other side. So you're breathing in to rotate, growing taller, growing longer and then breathing out to come back down. So you're breathing in, rotate, grow taller, find that spiraling energy in the spine, and breathing out to come back into center. So this one's called the Cossack. Breathing in to rotate, breathing out to come back into center. You see here I've changed my hands. So you start with the hands crossed across the chest, and then you come into your Cossack position, 
If you've got a bangle or a watch on, that is pretty much the midpoint between the elbows. Try and keep your nose lining up with the midpoint. If you haven't got a watch or a bangle, then you're looking at your wrist bone. And just get the wrist bone in the middle. And then you're going to breathe in and you're going to keep your nose lined up with the wrist bone. You're breathing out to come back into center. Breathing in. So in the beginning, in the first few classes, the most important thing is learning how to keep your pelvis fixed, not moving. So your knees are soft, your hips are like headlamps on a parked car. They're not turning with the arm or the rib cage so that you disassociate your rib cage from your pelvis to get that beautiful lumbar spine stretch. Okay, so that's called the Cossack. Relaxing the arms, just moving the legs. So coming into um, feet a little bit wider than hip space, and we're just going to bend the knee on the right side, bend the knee on the left. So suddenly we notice how tight we are on the inside of our legs. As you bend the knee on the straight leg side, press your big toe into the floor and you'll feel the connection from the big toe right the way up into the pelvic floor. So this is all part of your deep core line. So these are the deeper muscles of the body that come up through the legs into the pelvic floor, abdominal muscles, spinal muscles, all around the heart and the pericardium and into the tongue. Okay, so as you get used to doing this, you could, you could bend the knee, but you could turn opposite shoulder towards bent knee, just bring in a little bit of rotation. Just make sure your hands are on your thigh, just make sure that you feel comfortable with this. Okay, and I'm looking at the camera, but you should really ideally be looking down at your big toe. So your neck is fairly relaxed, it's fairly neutral. So this deep inner core line can be super tight. We don't even know it because leg muscles generally don't tell you that they're tight and out of balance. We're walking all day. They have to do what they have to do. But when we stretch them, we suddenly notice, oh, there is a little bit of a problem there super tight to so come back into center keep the legs at that wider stance wider than hip space bend the knee on the right so this is the first of um one of the classical exercises in pilates you're going to put your hand at the front of your thigh just for a little bit of support for your back you're going to take your other arm up and over into a nice curve and come back into center so this is called the mermaid or the merman. And it's a lateral movement. So you're moving to the side, you're stretching through the side lines of your body. Okay. So what we have to remember with the mermaid is we want to bring the body into a nice curve, a C curve. So there you see. So from old days of aerobics exercise classes, we tended to bring the arm into a straight arm, we even brought it across the face so that we disassociated the arm altogether. We want to keep the arm in the stretch. So the curved arm means that you're stretching through the whole of that side from the little finger right the way to the hip. And if you don't straighten the arm, you keep the shoulder and the neck relatively relaxed. If you straighten the arm, you're gonna push tension into the shoulder push tension into the neck. So just remember the curve. So I've always said to people, imagine you've got like a big halo around your head and the arm is forming part of that halo. You don't let the arm come into your personal space. So now bend the knee on the other side. Make sure as you bend your knee that you don't rotate your body, which is a big tendency. So you're keeping your box pointing forward as you bend the knee, you're supporting yourself on the top of the thigh. You're coming up and over. And you suddenly notice how tight you are on this side. So think of the big halo around the head. You're not bringing the arm across. You're not, you're not bending and straightening the legs as you do this. You stay very fixed in the legs so that you can create a stable movement for the spine. If you're moving in and out of it, in and out of it, there's too much information and you might be overworking. So just 
keep it safe. Remember that your main objective in this exercise is to find that C curve. So that's the part of the C curve that we can find, that we can see. The other bit is just, you know, imaginary because you've got your hand on your thigh. You want to feel that you're opening the space between the rib and the hip on that stretching side. So you're disassociating your rib cage from your pelvis again, but this time the disassociation is in a lateral movement, not in a rotational movement. So all of these movements are really important for spinal health. So my thoracic spine is stretching, my lumbar spine, even into my sacrum is all getting a lovely stretch. Last one. And come back into center. So from here, you would walk your toes in, your heels in, your toes, your heels, and you come back to just standing. So this is the first lesson in introduction to Pilates. If you want to, if you're keen to, you can now go and find the second class, which takes you into the second half of um, this movement. And I'm going to do um, four altogether, progressing you so that eventually you're ready to do that first begin class that's on my website. And you can keep coming back to these for reference as well.